Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Gossip Finance, where I'm your host, Alacia Singer. And I'm Duncan Sandlin. How's everybody doing? How's it doing, Lace? How are you? I'm excellent. I can't wait to jump into the news. I can't wait to jump into the news. You're all excited about the Fed, huh? I'm super excited about the Fed. I, I mean, I could be more excited about the Fed, but I could definitely be less excited about the Fed. I don't know. Jerome Powell, white, hot, sex pot, that guy. I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know he's your type. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I like him old and pale. <laughs> we are ready now to go for the Fed decision in Steve Lee's. The Federal Reserve maintaining its interest rate at five and a quarter to five and a half percent. But the committee continues trying to determine the, quote, extent of additional policy firming that may be appropriate. So there's this bias in the statement suggesting they're still looking to raise rates. And indeed, the average Fed forecast does continue to look for one more hike this year with an average forecast of 5.6 percent. Importantly, and I'll come back to that. There are two fewer cuts, 25 base point cuts built in for next year on the economy. Economic growth was upgraded to solid from moderate. Job growth was said to have slowed but remained strong. Inflation remains elevated, and the committee repeated its commitment to a 2% inflation target. The all right, so let's boil all that down. Ugh. So one thing about finance is... They, they, there's all this jargon and they love to throw numbers at you. And part of it's because we want you to think we're smarter than you are. <laughs> but really. And, and they, they want to make it sound like they're saying something that's like way higher level and, and way right. classier than what it actually is. Right. Right. So essentially this is it. So so the, dumb it down for us, my friend. Dumb it down for us. So the Federal Reserve Bank, is they set the rates on on borrowing money. Essentially, they're basically the government's bank, right? So they could have all the government's money and they issue out most of it. The Treasury does too, but that's a different branch. But they issue out a lot of money and they issue out bonds and things like that. So they, they set the whatever the rate is going to be. And then that goes to the banks who borrow that and the banks that borrow from them and down the system, right, all the way to us. Now, the reason you raise rates is because you want to cool off the economy. You want to slow down the economy because you're afraid it's getting too hot. There's going to be too much inflation, you know, which can be really bad. Well, that was part of the big concern is they were afraid coming out of COVID. The inflation was real high. It was too hot. Now, we know inflation was high, not because of traditional causes. Right. Like part of it was some supply demand shit or supply, lack of supply. But a lot of it was corporations realize people are coming out, they're spending we can now inflate the prices as much as we want for the most part, and people will still pay it. So it was artificial inflation so they could maximize their profits. They basically, yeah, let's screw the consumer was the game, and they got away with it. I mean, they were going to get away with it. So that's what caused a lot of the inflation. The inflation's been coming down, though, since people have been back to work, and it's been more level, right? Now there's more competitors back in the market. So... I'm not sure that the Fed did anything really to cool inflation by raising rates. Now, if inflation was high, it peaked at 11, it's down to whatever it is, uh, 3.68 now, which is up from last month. It was like 3.17. So it is a big jump. But nonetheless, 3.68 is not terrible. The average historical rate in the U.S. is like 3.2. The Fed wants to get it down to 2. I'm not sure... That's kind of their magical number for some reason. I'm not sure where they get that from. Right. So that, that number, as far as you're concerned, is a bit arbitrary. Yeah, I mean, you want inflation to be around 25 to maybe 3.5% at any given time, right? So when they said they go 2, it's like, well, what you've done is you've set a bar that allows you to kind of willy-nilly decide what you're going to do with the rates. Right? It's It's, you know, I mean, it's... I can't think of a good example, but it's it's basically it gives you an excuse to do what you want, right? It's a get out of jail free card. Well, the rates aren't at two, so or that I'm sorry, inflation's not at two, so we're gonna raise the rates again until it goes down. Well, it's like, is it really affecting inflation though at this point? Can we say that? Do we know? Um, you know, that you could make an argument one way or the other because the inflation was coming down before they did this. So what they've decided is we're going to keep them up to where they're at. Right now they're between 
five and a quarter and five and a half percent. Okay. What does this mean for you, the average person? It means if you go out and buy a car, you're going to be paying higher interest rates on the loan. If you buy a house, higher interest rates on the loan. Housing interest rates were at an all-time low back in 2019. It was like 2.7%. So you bought a new house, you pay 2.7% interest on that loan, on the home loan. Now they're over 7 and they're predicting they're going to go as high as 8%. So people today, you're paying at least three times more or around three times more than, than people were three years ago, four years ago. So that's what the rate's done. What it's done, though, is it's squeezed workers. And tradition, I think the thought of the Fed is traditionally, a lot of the times when you see big inflation, historically speaking, it's because um, pay has gone up. Or workers' benefits have gone up, and it's and companies have been sort of strangled to have to pay these higher wages and be to be competitive to get workers, and that's caused a lot of inflation historically. But we know today that's not what caused the inflation problem, and it's a different market today because just laziest generations, not considering even the the new kids, right, the alphas and the Zs coming out, right. Our generation was three times more productive than our parents. One of us was worth three of our parents, right? So productivity has made up a lot of the difference in growth and money. And part of it is because how we're educated, part of it's machines. I will say this, a lot of millennials and younger people are lacking in basic English skills. Lacey can tell you all about that. Yeah, that might be another video, Doug. That might yeah. be another video. But they are. Um, but they're really. Save that for the one where people want to watch something like old Yeller and Cry. I yeah, we can bitch about that some other time. But, right. but they are better with computers and they are productive. Right. And with a computer, like just financial planning, right? It used to be to run a practice, I'd have to have three or four people working for me. Now I can do all that with a laptop and the right software. You know, saves me tens of thousands of dollars. So that's what's going on is they're saying, okay, we're going to keep the rates high. Part of it is, is to strangle workers. I think that's just my opinion. I could be wrong, but I think it's, they're, they're upset because workers are now sitting there going, well, wait a minute, these companies made all these profits. We didn't get a raise. And the, the wealth and income gap has grown. It's, and it's still growing and it's peaked in this country. And it's worse than it is in any other developed country for the most part. So that's what's going on. That's it. I mean, that's the whole kick and caboodle right there. I mean, there's not much point in watching any more of this. That's all that's really happening. We're going to keep rates high. Why? Because we want to sort of squeeze the market and we're going to do it by basically making it impossible for middle and lower income people to buy homes and cars and shit and to borrow money. And let's not forget that those, you know, middle and lower income folks that have student loans have those payments coming due too. So yeah. that's even less that they can afford. I know it's related to a different thing, but it's all a part of your wallet and it all impacts what you can actually afford. So yeah. it just got a whole lot tougher for a whole lot of people. Well, and the other counter argument to that is it hasn't all this, all these rate hikes they've done for the last couple of years um, hasn't slowed down the economy at all. So it's not really having the effect they thought it was going to have. Well, yet they're going to jump around and shout victory for sure. At some point, yeah. It was part of my master plan all along. <laughs> right, right, exactly. This was definitely a part of my plan. This was my mastermind. No, no, yeah. it, it wasn't really. No. no, 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 you're an idiot. All right, so let's, uh, we'll do a little bit more with this with the rate hikes. Uh, We'll do Money Watch on CBS Mornings. Are you ready? So, so she's mm -hmm. this analyst. She's going to talk a little bit about the rate hikes, but then she's going to go into the uh, auto union or the United Auto Workers strike, the union strike. And we're going to have a, a discussion about that because that's really fascinating. So I think this woman, I didn't see this whole clip, but I think she soft soaks this quite a bit. In today's Money Watch, we are talking about the government's latest move on the economy. 
The Federal Reserve decided to hold interest rates steady yesterday after raising rates 11 times in the past year and a half to fight inflation. Meanwhile, the United Auto Workers strike against the big three automakers is in its sixth day with about 13,000 workers on the picket line. Yesterday, General Motors and Stellantis announced new layoffs that they blame on the strike. CBS News business analyst Jill Schlesinger is here to break it all down like boxes on recycling day. How are you doing? I'm doing well. All right, let's jump right into it. So the Federal Reserve, why did they decide to keep interest rates the same and steady? They basically believe the economy is expanding at a pretty solid pace, that the employment landscape is good, and they are encouraged by the most general categories of inflation coming down. So as a result, they kind of are saying, we need to take a pause right now. We may raise them in the future, but for today, we're good, and that was it. So we are still, though, at a 22-year high in short-term interest rates, five and a quarter to five and a half percent. Borrowers, you better get used to it. This is going to be sticking around for a while. And in- so I also want to say this. So you already mentioned it. Now they're going to take a victory lap. She just kind of already did for them. Yep. Oh, yeah, no, see, inflation's they going down. It. They did it. See, it's the economy's great. It's really stable. It's all because, no, they were supposed, they were trying to slow the economy. That's what raising the rates is supposed to do. It hasn't slowed the economy. The economy's crushing it. I mean, the economy's doing really well, and it's growing and growing, and inflation's starting to go down. And, and it's not, you can't sit there and go, well, we're going to raise rates to combat inflation by slowing down the economy. And the economy doesn't slow, but inflation goes down and go, that was me. No, you were trying to slow the economy. That's all you were trying to do, (laughs) right? And you didn't do it. (laughs) They're gonna spin it, just like I called it. They're gonna spin it so they can take a victory lap, so that they can tell the American people that all the stuff they did with the rate did exactly what we needed to, so now we're doing awesome. Right. And the average person is going to go, hmm, okay, I guess it did what they wanted it to do, not realizing they're making shit up. Yeah. They're, just... they're literally, like, they're making shit up. Well, I, you could make the argument, but the bottom line is, is she's not even making the argument. She's just saying that's what happened. It's like, eh, is it, though? Is it Jill? Is it really? So let's uh, let's watch a little bit more of Jill here. Jill's gonna break it all down like recycling boxes on recycling day. <laughs> what does it mean right, for well, inflation? Let's, let's Another goal is to get it down to two percent. Yeah, I mean they've made great progress if you think about it. In the summer of twenty two, we reached a peak of the consumer price index, nine point one percent. It was horrible, right? We're now down to 3.7% on an annualized basis, but the Fed does target 2%. They think that's the right pace for the economy to grow, to create jobs, and for workers to be okay with their take-home pay. Well, I'll tell you what's going to be hard for the Fed, going from this current level of 3.7% to 2%. This last 1.7% is going to be difficult for them. You keep hearing people complain about the cost of things, but then you hear about how inflation is supposedly going down. Is, is that number, does that include gas prices and like eggs and milk? And stuff? Uh, yes. So that top line number, 3.7, is inclusive of everything. The Fed does like to look at the core level. It strips away food and energy because those are such volatile categories. Like gas prices are up really enormously over the last few months because Russia and Saudi Arabia cut production. So when we take that out of it, the general rate of the core inflation is driving lower. And that is good news. Super interesting. Let's go to the end. Yeah, part of that is uh, food, not so much. Foods tends to be, groceries and things tend to be fairly inelastic because people need them. You can't not eat. I mean, I guess you could, right. but it wouldn't be a good idea. Right? I do remember watching a movie like that where... Um, we were trying to train the cattle to not eat yeah. by giving them less and less of day. I wish I could remember what that movie is, but you know what? It's been tried. I mean, it doesn't work out so well, but. Yeah. Manna from heaven. Tried. You can just live on manna from heaven. Anyway. Um, yeah. You know, gas prices, but part of it is she's, she makes, once again, she sort of made this odd point where it's like, yeah, but it's going down. It's like, 
then how much of that is because of the federal funds rate? Especially when the economy is still hot. Right? How much of that is the Fed rate? I mean, it's, I don't see where she's going with that. I mean, it's, it's almost like she's sort of countering her argument. Not that the average viewer of CBS Morning is going to know that probably, <laughs> I mean, but nerds like us who follow the Fed, yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah, she kind of disproved the point. Um, we'll watch another minute of her and then we'll move on. United Auto Workers, strike for just a second, because I've heard you say they have more leverage now than they did back in 2019. How is that possible? Well, it's interesting because when you look at what's happened to the labor market amid the pandemic, things really blew out, right? So first we were worried about automakers surviving. Then there was a surge of people who wanted cars. And when you look back to the last contract in 2019, don't forget, they negotiated that contract when it was 2% inflation. Now, both the automakers and the union members know inflation prices are up by 20% from 2019. So just to get them to like the fair level today, they've got to get a 20% increase. I also think that the union understands it's a tight labor market still. And it is important for these automakers to keep these people on the job because they've got to be competitive in the global market with electric vehicles. And we're saying so many strong. Yep, yeah, that's I think she's kind of nailed that. With the auto workers yep. strike and we'll move on yeah. to that we'll move on to that here in a sec but yeah the auto workers have a lot of leverage because and, and that's just everywhere because it is a tight labor market coming out of the pandemic the other problem you have is and we talked about this with the pandemic a couple times we had a lot of clients retire early because of the pandemic i mean i know i did i'm sure you had a bunch of your your people that were like i i'm done i'm bailing I'm not going to stay at work and risk dying. Right. Right. I'm going to retire now and take my money and just walk and just live off less. Right. Um, but a lot of people who would still be working a day are not because they left. And so you had a huge exodus there. Then you had a lot of people staying at home because they got some money from the government, which was good. And what you saw is that money was spent and came back into the economy, which was a positive. And then, they got out and realized, wait a minute, I've been working for peanuts, killing myself, and I'm not getting anywhere. Wages aren't going up. So people started saying, well, look, I, you know, I survived three or four months in the pandemic, not doing anything or six months or a year or whatever it was per person. And I was much happier living on less. So why am I killing myself for some company where I'm getting paid next to nothing? If I'm going to make next to nothing, that's fine as long as I have more free time. Right. People evaluated their, their priorities and realized their boss wasn't really high on their list. Yeah. Well, I mean, shouldn't be. Yep. You know what? But people tend to forget that. People tend to um, place their, wrap their identities into what they do to earn a paycheck and, you know, give priority and loyalty to their employer beyond that, which actually makes sense for a balanced life, in my opinion. Yeah. And I think part of it is attitudes change, especially a lot in the eighties and nineties about business and about work. I mean, it used to be like, you know, in the fifties, sixties and seventies, the, the idea was you, you, one person could work, usually the man. And that was more than enough to buy a house and two cars and, you know, wife to stay at home and raise the kids. I mean, if you were a white man, sorry, but <laughs> if you were a black guy, it was a different story. If you were Native American, it was a different story. But, but that sort of mentality, and I think a lot of people are nostalgic about that, especially conservatives. You know, why can't we get back to that? It's like, yeah, but we had to oppress a lot of other groups. You know, single women, minorities, right? Um, but that's part of it. The other part of it was in. It used to be that you you work to live kind of mentality. Now it's more of the, your job is your identity kind of thing. And I think that's, I think that's become more part of the culture. And then I think a lot of the, like the millennials and the younger generations are sitting there going, fuck that. It's not like my, my, my wages are going up, you know? 
I mean, I might as well do something else. And so that's kind of, I think, what's being done here. But that's why you've got kind of a squeeze in the labor market is people are want more. If I'm going to have to now put on pants and go to work, <laughs> I want another 20%. I want another 40%. Make it worth my while. You know. That is fair. I have come up with my pants number. Everybody's pants <laughs> number is different, but I'm not putting pants on for less than blank, yeah. right? It gets higher as you get older, kids. <laughs> Be surprised how hard it is to put on pants as you get older. <laughs> anyway, so let's look at a little bit of the uh, uh, United Auto Workers strike. This is CBS Live. I don't. We got CBS a lot today for some reason. Labor standoff between the UAW and Detroit's big three automakers is nearing a second week. Yes, both sides are vowing to expand their actions if negotiators cannot work out a deal by Friday. Nearly 13,000 GM, Ford, and Stellantis workers are now on strike at three facilities. The union president says more workers will walk off the job tomorrow unless there is serious progress in the negotiations. Meanwhile, automakers say more layoffs are coming if the strike continues. CBS News senior transportation correspondent Chris Van Cleve joins us now from Michigan. Chris, it's uh, good to see you. So the UAW has set a Friday deadline for a deal. What's going to happen tomorrow if another... 12 to 15,000 uh, auto workers walk off the job. Well, we don't know how many auto will be called on to strike. It could be similar to what we saw a week ago. It could be much larger. Uh, right now, they have uh, called a strike at three plants. It's about 13,000 UAW workers on strike. Uh, the, the union could do the same thing again and pick three more plants. They could go much bigger. Uh, we, so we don't know. But what will happen is whatever plants are struck, the workers will walk off the job tomorrow, uh, and those plants will cease producing whatever it is they make if they're in assembly. So, yeah, so now it's become kind of a, a pissing contest, right? You strike, we're laying people off. Which I think is, you know, I don't know the whole situation with the, the, the three big ones, but I would sit there and go, you start laying these people off when they're striking, one, it looks horrible. The PR is terrible. Oh, yeah, yeah. How can you spin that? Right. And two, you're going to you're gonna eat it in lawsuits and unemployment checks. And for the people who don't know this, if you own a business and you fire your employee and you don't have a... And your unemployment premiums. Right. Well, and then you, yeah, then you, and you don't have a good cause and your employee says, hey, I think I was wrongfully fired or they didn't have, they didn't give me a reason or whatever it was, right? And they go to unemployment, unemployment rules in their favor. It's a, it's not even a court. It's a separate unemployment rules. Guess who's paying their unemployment check? You are the employer who fired them. <laughs> so if you fuck, I mean, we're going to, we're going to lay off 13, well, 13,000 people are striking. I can't remember how they, they laid off. It might've been about that same number. But it's like, you lay off all those people, that's all unemployment you have to pay now. Not that unemployment's super expensive, but still, you're paying people to not work at this point. So the, the big thing with this is, so Bernie Sanders came out on this and um, the Democrats, Biden's been real supportive of the union, which is kind of a big switch for him because he kind of left the train workers union, you know, he basically kind of told them to suck it. But here's Bernie Sanders, and he's talking about it real quick. And we'll just, we'll watch a little bit. I'm not going to watch the whole thing with him, but. For joining me uh, to discuss a very important and timely issue. In the United States today, at a time of unprecedented income and wealth inequality, weekly wages for the average American worker are actually lower than they were 50 years ago after adjusting for inflation. Quite unbelievable. And that means that despite a massive increase in worker productivity, despite CEOs now making nearly 400 times more than what their employees are, despite record-breaking corporate profits, dividends, and stock buybacks, the average American worker in many respects 
is worse off economically today than he or she was 50 years ago. That morally grotesque and growing inequality is exactly what has been occurring in the automobile industry for decades. This time, however, under new union leadership, the members of the UAW are fighting back. If the big three automakers, General Motors, Ford, and Stellantis, do not provide reasonable contracts to address long-standing inequities in the industry, there will be a strike. And all of us should support the strikers. I agree with all that. Yeah. I don't yeah. know what else to right. say yeah. other than I agree with all that. Now. Feeling the burn on that one. Yep. Yeah. Now, it's become kind of a PR war, right? Where GM and Stellantis and Ford are trying to fight back and sit there and say, well, you know, we kind of have to, I mean, I think they offered, GM offered 20% raise, it's something else, but they didn't offer a ton on the table, but they're like, oh, but this was a, this was unprecedented. We offered them a ton. And they're like, no, you didn't. Right. Um, here's the counter argument. All right, and we're going to do this. This was from Yahoo Finance. And the article, just so you guys can see that I'm not lying to you, what striking workers get wrong about automaker profits? And I'm just going to read a little bit for you real quick. So General Motors spent $21 billion on stock buybacks during the last 12 years. A lot of money, $21 billion in stock buybacks, which basically inflates the price of their stock. Uh, it should give more money to assembly line workers instead. That's the logic of the United Auto Workers Union, which is staging an intensifying strike against GM Ford and Jeep parent Stellantis. So far, nearly 13,000 members are off. Now, the whole thing about this as he gets down to it is uh, the, the Detroit Three, the big three companies, GM, Ford, and Stellantis, Profitability compared to the best automakers in Japan and Europe, Toyota and Volkswagen, along with Tesla, which only makes electric vehicles, GM and Ford trailed the other four in total profits. If you measure it by percentage, if you measure it by total amount of money, they didn't, but if you measure it by percentage, uh, and you got to remember, Tesla only started making money in 2020. True. Tesla was, it was a them. non-profit for a long time. So they're comparing this out and they're like, so Tesla, Tesla it wasn't a, it was not, not profitable, non-profit. So I'm sorry. You know what? That tweets in words was really funny. I know. Sorry. That was a slip of the tongue. So Tesla had a 15.4, 15.4% margin on 2022, uh, 9.4 for Stellantis. Oh, Jesus, that's still town was 10%. That's pretty good. 6.3 for GM and negative 1.3 for Ford. Um, GM is, he does, he ignores this, but GM is now the second largest uh, electric vehicle manufacturer in the world behind Tesla. But they're saying they can't compete with Tesla. GM's got more plants, more people. It's a whole different entity. And they're going to compare profits and I want to show you guys this. So this is the profit comparison chart they make in this argument and this. So automaker profits, BMW, Toyota, right? Over the last 10 years were really great profits, Mercedes, Hyundai, and then GM, Honda, you know, whatever, Volkswagen, Ford, Stellantis, Nissan, and Tesla. What I want to point out to you is this. This is why I think this is such a shitty argument, right? BMW, okay? Where are they located? Berlin, Germany, right? Toyota's Jap Japan, Mercedes, Germany, right? Hyundai, Japan, and then GM, Honda, and Volkswagen, all about the same, Ford, Stellantis, kind of hiding behind them. These are American companies and they're, they're, these Volkswagen and Honda are like more economy cars. So they're not going to see a ton of growth. But if you're comparing those profits and say, well, wait a second, that's the problem is, is they can't get investors to come in 
and invest. Well, that's a stupid argument. They're blue chip companies. They get investors by paying dividends, not by inflating their stock with stock buybacks. You know, nobody's running out and buying Coke because they think Coca-Cola is going to suddenly shoot up in price. The company's plateaued out. They're pretty much maxed. I mean, they're going to grow little bits at a time. But if you're looking for a growth investment, they're not not shooting up. Yeah, it's like I'm not going to invest in Nike for a long term growth stock. I'm going to invest in Nike because I want to get dividends. Right. <laughs> you know, it's the same thing. So they're they're kind of, I mean, it's apples to oranges. So you can't sit there and go, okay, well, they have to do this. Uh, so Tesla's average margin is negative, but that's only because they started, only started making a profit in 2020. Uh, let's see. What do you want to say? GM and Ford have been dismal performers with GM down 15% during the last 10 years and Ford down 29. Um, I don't know where he's getting that from. Oh, their stock price. Sorry. Yeah. So that's, I mean, but part of that is just what the economies have done and GM and Ford didn't really get into the electric vehicle game until recently. And that's where, Everything's moving, right? And when was the last time GM and Ford had anything really new or interesting to talk about? Oh, jeez, I can't even remember. Yeah, they're just making the same shit over and over. So that sounds to me more like a leadership problem. So like when you read this, it sounds a little compelling. Well, maybe they're they're not getting the investors and they're not making it. And, and maybe the workers just have to take it, right? Because if it's all about... But, but it starts with that first big thing, which is the bullshit thing, which is because this was this when I first read this, I'm like, there might be an argument here. And then when I thought about it for a few minutes and then came back, I was like, no, this is bullshit. Because the first thing is General Motors spent 21 billion in stock buybacks. It should give more money to assembly line workers. That's their UAW's argument is what this is saying. No, their argument is the executives and the CEOs got 40 percent raises over the last four years and we got nothing. Oh boy! So it's hard to reconcile that. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna move in here real quick. Let's see if I can. Forty uh, percent, I... no percent. I mean, oh. Oh no, absolutely. So here we go. So this is the majority report with Sam Cedar, and he's talking to I think it's David Dayen, um, who's a journalist, and they're talking about this, and they're gonna watch a clip of. Uh, I forget her first name, Barra, Mary Barra, who's the CEO of GM. Uh, and uh, her, uh, the CEO of uh, GM, uh, Mary Barra, uh, Barra. And, and this is this is the exchange. This was pretty impressive. <clears throat> the union is demanding, asking for a 40% wage increase over four years. They're asking for that in part because they say CEOs like yourself, uh, leading the big three, are making those kind of pay increases over the course of the last four years. You've seen a 34% pay increase in your salary. You make almost $30 million. Why should your workers not get the same type of pay increases that you're getting leading the company? Well, if you look at uh, compensation, my compensation, 92% of it is based on performance of the company. I think one of the strong aspects <laughs> of the way our compensation for our representative employees is designed is not only do, are we putting a 20% increase on the table, we have profit sharing. So when the company does well, everyone does well. And for the last seven years, that's resulted in record profit sharing for our representative employees. And I think you have to look at the whole uh, compensation package, not only 20% increase in gross wage, but also... Uh, the profit sharing aspect of it, world class health care, and there's several uh, other features. So we think we have a very competitive offer on the table, and that's why we want to get back there and get this done. But if you- okay, so I'm going to tell you this. So this is where this is just the cracks me up that answer. So, and it goes back to that argument where you can make the argument that, yeah, they kind of have to protect their cash finances so they can get more investors and reinvest. That's fine, but they're still. She's gotten a 40% raise over the last four years. She now makes almost $30 million. She makes 29, roughly, a little over 29. Now, her other argument is we do take care of our employees, and this is kind of the deal. And uh, 
she brings up the whole profit sharing thing. Right, profit sharing. And she brings up this whole deal about, um, what was it? Oh, this is what it was. So this uh, Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg and Business Insider all ran with this. She was saying it costs us $67 an hour per employee, but it only costs Tesla 45. Right? So we're already paying $20 more an hour for our employees than say Tesla. You have to be careful though. She's saying it costs total $67 an hour per employee on average. That includes benefits and all that. She's also including her benefits and her pay into that figure. And all the executives who've gotten huge increases. And of course at Tesla, the executives haven't, aren't, don't get a ton of money because executive contracts usually are based on performance and Tesla hasn't performed. So of course that number is inflated downwardly. So here's the other thing. So I went and looked at indeed.com and here it is. Uh, on the left is General Motors salaries. On the right is Tesla's, okay? So this is Tesla on the on the right, GM on the left. Software engineer at GM, eighty four thousand. Tesla, one hundred and thirty three thousand. Software senior software engineer at GM, one hundred and twenty one. Tesla, one hundred and fifty four. All right, let's go all the way down. If you go to uh, what was it, factory workers? Where did I have that? Design engineer, test engineer, blah, 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 blah. Oh, where did I have it? I'll find it here in a second. But yeah, I mean, so GM pays less than Tesla. Do you know by about how much? About 35%. So for GM employees to go, wait a minute, we want 40%. Here it was, comparing GM and owners. Okay. Uh, what was it? Uh... Let's see, compared to industry average of 61,000 a year, Tesla pays an average of 108. So Tesla pays their employees 76% higher than the industry average. Wow. Uh, do Tesla employees so make- Tesla's not even profitable and they're managing to pay 30 some percent more to their employees than GM is. That's, that's insane. Right. Tesla CEO Elon Musk has confirmed that Tesla's non-unionized employees actually get paid an hourly basis more than their unionized counterparts at GM Motors. So Tesla pays more and they're non-union. And the other thing about it is, is Tesla employees, if, if you go look back at the Indeed thing, uh, Tesla employees are not happy. They think Tesla sucks. There are a lot more complaints about Tesla than there are. <laughs> you know, Tesla employees have to work longer hours and and all that shit. So, but but that's my point is is for her to sit there and go, well, it's sixty seven dollars per employee, right? Well, it's like, yeah, but you're also including yourself into that, right? Which inflates it for sure, and it's a little bit of a bullshit argument coming from somebody who, if you factor it out, um, she makes approximately $14,500 an hour. So 67, you kind of want to go, fuck you. <laughs> I mean, 29 million a year. She makes roughly 14,000 an hour. Wow. So when Bernie's sitting there going, uh, you know, it's, you know, 400% more, let's see. Let's say it is even 67. Yeah, it's like 215 times more than, you know. It just kills me, man. <laughs> I mean, uh, let's see, GM starting pay, what is it? Come on, computer, man. It just, I mean, it's just a bullshit argument from her. 
Oh, here we go. GM hourly pay ranges starting 20 an hour for a pr production worker to $80 for a senior software engineer. So their average uh, assembly line worker is getting paid nothing. Average assembly line worker makes $43 an hour. 13.96 per hour for cashier. But yeah. So they make around 40 bucks an hour. And that's if you've been there for a while. So, yep. This goes to show you. So this whole thing with the arguments about the stock buybacks, that's part of it, but it's not the bigger part of it. The bigger part of it is the CEOs are making a ton of money. All the executives are making a ton of money and we get nothing. And we're paid less than guys at Tesla who are fucking not even making a profit. I mean, that's insane. The company that's not making a profit is paying their employees more. Right. Well, they're making a profit now, but I mean, it's still pretty pathetic. Um, but yeah, let's see. And then I want to do this next page. This was also the majority report. But this is Republicans. Now this is oh, sorry. Our, uh, Republicans have got to blame the auto workers. We got to find a way to demonize them. <laughs> so let's watch this real quick because this is just amazing to me. Going after in the wake of the Summix case where we see the import of the uh, National Labor Relations Board appointed by, um, by uh, Joe Biden. Now we talk about uh, taking the next step, um, considering the delay tactics and sitting down and, and, and forming a contract with a, a newly formed union as an unfair labor practice, one that could be punishable by an enforced contract. Um, let's flip to the other side of the ledger and get a sense of how supportive Nikki Haley, the anti-Trump, uh, would be of unions. Here she is. Now, to, to, to news today, as you know, we're entering day two of this United Auto Workers strike. We understand, Ambassador, that uh, Chrysler uh, is the latest company to have offered a 21% uh, pay rate for workers of, over those four years. Uh, that kind of mimics what Ford and GM had offered, but that was quickly turned down. What do you make of that and where this is going? If they're turning down a raise like that, um, what does that tell you? Well, I think that's uh, it tells you that when you have the most pro-union president and he touts that he is um, emboldening the unions, this is what you get. And I'll tell you who pays for it is the taxpayers. You know, here, from what I understand, the union is asking for a 40 percent raise. Um, you know, the companies have come back with a 20 percent raise. I think any of the taxpayers would love to have a 20 percent raise and think that's great. But, you know, the problem is this is going to we're all going to suffer from this. This is going to cost things to go up and you know this is gonna last a while but you know, <laughs> i love the fucking but that's what it is those greedy greedy auto workers making around 20 to 40 bucks an hour they are gonna tank the economy and ruin it for the rest of us just just because they're so selfish why can't they just take one for the team and spend the rest of their lives making fucking peanuts Gee, or maybe some of those high-paid executives could take one for the team, lower their own pain, spread it out around the employees a little bit. Well, yeah. Oh, we couldn't do something like that now. I was going to say. I could be more less than $14,000 an hour. Let's see. Well, well, let's say 40 bucks an hour. We'll, do, we'll say that's about 80000 a year. So we'll say... The CEO takes a million dollar pay cut. So she could, uh, what was that? Hang on, one million. About 80,000. Just because I'm too lazy to do the math. That's 12 people. That you could double their pay if you wanted to. If you just wanted to give them a 30, 40% raise. Right? That's still. You know, that's what, what, 40 or 50 people? 
And all she has to do for her, it's 129th of her pay. She has to take a 3.4% pay cut. And who's selfish? I know. That's my fucking point. It's so stupid. And Nikki Haley. And this is such a stupid thing, too, because, like, the guy, the argument from the, um, the fi yeah, finance article, it's the, well, but see, BMW and all these, I'm like, you realize BMW doesn't have to pay health care for their employees in Germany. They pay health care for their manufacturing plants here. But they don't have to pay for any of that in Berlin. You know, Toyota doesn't have to pay for health care. I mean, why don't, and now you got Nikki Haley. I'm kind of like, well, gee, Nikki Haley, if we had universal health care, if we had child tax credits and daycare and all that stuff, you'd save GM a shit ton of money on employee costs, wouldn't you? True. And they could afford to pay more. Oh, well, but we couldn't have something like that now. No, mm -hmm. no. But Nikki Haley, who also wants to cut your Social Security. Yep. We'll watch another minute of this. But yeah, she's just, I just blows my mind that this is all she, I mean. Just remember when you vote Republican, you're voting for your money to be taken out of your pocket. When you have a president, okay, just to be clear. Taxpayers. Yep. Uh, to be clear, it's not uh, just the union that's asking for this raise. It's all the workers are asking for this raise. And to be clear, when she says all these things are going to go up, that includes wages, both uh, within the uh, car industry and without. There is plenty of data that shows the implications of unionization within an industry. And just within, like, uh, the, the greater the union density regionally, it will also impact wages there because you got an opportunity to get a, a high-paying union job. Other uh, uh, other non-union outfits are going to have to compete for those same workers. So when she says taxpayer... So it comes back to kind of the whole theme, and we kind of skimmed it over a little bit, but it's like the Fed raising rates, who does that hurt? It hurts the workers. Why are we doing that? Because they want more money, and so we're trying to make them more desperate. So we squeeze the workers, right? So they'll go back and work worse jobs for less money because they're desperate, right? Now you get Nikki Haley saying the exact same thing about the, oh, they're destroying the economy, blah, blah, blah. They should just go back and take, take one for the team. This is literally the king going out and saying to the serfs, well, the problem that you don't, the reason you don't have food is because you're not producing enough. You're not working hard enough. Not because I've taken all of it and given it to the army. And I left you guys with nothing but rotten food. That's what started the French Revolution. The people were starving in Paris. Because they, they were in all these stupid wars. And so all the food went to the front. And the people in Paris were left with rotten shit. And they started protesting because they were hungry. And then they started killing rich people and taking their shit. That's what started. That's part of what started the French Revolution. It's like, but that's what they're doing. That's exactly what she's. See, you need to sit there and take the hit, Mister Twenty Dollars an Hour, so that the fourteen thousand dollar an hour CEO, right, who I'm sure has a donates a lot to a lobby and whatnot. I'm sure Nikki Haley gets kickbacks from all that, right. So that, yeah, so that I could afford my next vacation or my yacht or my new house or, you know, why aren't the surfs surfing, man? <laughs> you know, Good question. why isn't, you know, why isn't my maid cleaning my house? Well, you haven't paid her in two weeks. Well, she should do it just out of loyalty because... <laughs> Because how am I supposed to function in a dirty house? <laughs> no, you got to pay people. <laughs> so nobody's volunteering for that. Yeah, fuck nobody's that. volunteering to do your damn laundry or your whatever other stuff. Yeah, nobody's fuck. volunteering. For that. 
Well, it's just a self-entitlement thing. That's the problem. It's the CEO kind of like, I don't know. I offered him 20%. I got 40, but I offered him 20. And you got to remember, my pay is based on performance. And the performance has been really good. Well, not because of anything you've done, but because we came out of the pandemic and demand spiked. I mean, just because you got lucky doesn't mean you're fucking talented or you merit $30 million a year. Yeah, these things are not the same. Yeah. Do you love it how the most meritless people in the world are always the ones that tell you it's all based on merit? Yeah, that's because you just happen to be rich. You can't just believe that, oh, no, I'm, I just happen to be rich because I got lucky or who my parents were. So anyway, we're going to move on to one last thing here for the news. Lauren Boebert. Lacey has not seen this story or heard it. I know we're kind of the last dog to the bowl on this one, but this is Lauren Boebert went to see Beetlejuice the musical. She went to the theater and uh, she had a, a grand old time. Are you ready, Lace? I don't know, am I? Okay. Yeah, you should. You should be. Here it is. Lauren Boebert goes to the theater. Tonight, surveillance video revealing the truth about the night Colorado Congresswoman Lauren Boebert was kicked out of a theater, her version of events going up in smoke. After denials, she was vaping inside a Denver theater during a musical performance of Beetlejuice. This video clears the air. Boebert is seen on video blowing smoke before the start of the show. The Colorado Republican Person. representative is also seen dancing and clapping along to the music, her arm raised above her head, even using flashed photography. <laughs> A woman sitting behind her appears to lean over and say something to Boebert. At one point, her date is apparently unable to keep his hands to himself. Eventually, the couple is escorted from the theater, Boebert giving staff the middle finger and allegedly saying, don't you know who I am? According to an incident report from the venue. <laughs> <laughs> we'll watch this this video revealed the true performance, her <laughs> campaign manager denying the allegations that Boebert was kicked out for vaping, telling the Washington Post in a statement there might have been a misunderstanding. <laughs> <laughs> nope, it's pretty clear. And attributing the source of the smoke to heavy fog machines and electronic cigarettes used at the show. NBC News has reached out to Drew Sexton, Boebert's campaign manager, and Boebert herself, but has not heard back. <laughs> So, pause. Okay, so that was Lauren Boebert. Now, they, I couldn't find the whole video. I was looking for it. I looked for it for a while. She also, at one point, grabs his crotch in the video. They kind of got him feeling up her boobs. So they were, like, feeling each other up. She's vaping. She's talking. She's waving her arms. There's a po couple points where she stands up, and she's the only one in the audience dancing. <laughs> I mean, so I have so many thoughts, so, so <laughs> many thoughts. So I guess I'm going to go to the place of, I mean, if y'all want to feel each other up in the theater, who am I to tell you not to? But you know, I feel like there are more discreet ways to do it. I mean, ask any teenager in a movie theater, right? Well, there... here's, here's. And, and she's like vaping and like blowing smoke into the hair of the person in front of her. I mean, I mean, she like very clearly is blowing smoke in that video. It's yeah. so obvious. Oh, yeah. Um, and the other thing about it is it's like, yeah, they kicked her out not so much because of the groping thing. They kicked her out because they're disturbing the other audience members. Right. And of course she plays the, you know who I am and flips everybody off deal. Right. It's like, okay, great. Oh my but this is, this is the family values woman. This is the, uh, she's a 36 year old grandmother. Because both her and her son had kids as teenagers. That's the only way that's possible. And the thing about it, which is really funny here is she's recently divorced. She's far right Republican. She's part of the whole anti-trans movement. The guy she's with is a Democrat, a registered Democrat, and he owns a business. And one of the big things about the venue he owns is they do drag shows, which are a big money maker for him. <laughs> so 
this just keeps getting stupider and stupider. So she's in the middle of a divorce. Beth fooling around with this guy on camera. And she's, I think next year, she's up for re-election. Because right now she's tanking I, in the polls. I sort of feel like somebody just needs to take that video that you showed and say, here's your family values right across it. Oh, I'm sure that's... I mean, uh, the truth of the matter is, I mean, and the groping is funny as I'll get out. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. That's some pretty funny stuff. Yeah, that was pretty funny. Some teenagers to give her some tips on how to be more discreet about that. Because <laughs> they're all waking around in the movie theater. But but the baby in the, like, the middle of the auditorium, like, so like blatantly blowing smoke in the person right in front of her, it's crazy to me. Like... You know, that and the you getting. Gotta know you can't. I'm not gonna get you freaking kicked out. Like, well, well that, that that and taking flash photography and getting up and dancing and talking through the whole thing. All of those are things that just standard get you kicked out of theaters. Period. Well, plus it's one of those things where you're talking about a musical. These people are paying what a minimum two hundred dollars a ticket. Some of them probably paying close to six or seven hundred dollars. Probably the woman behind her was probably paid six or seven hundred dollars for that seat. Easily. Well, if she shot some film and gave it to TMZ, <laughs> she'd make that back real fast. <laughs> she should have. So here was a. Uh, oh, God. Oh, shoot. So you know who uh, John Fetterman is? He's the senator from, uh, oh, gosh, Pennsylvania. So he had. He chimed in with a tweet because uh, uh, it's just funny. So I, I'm, I'm just going to show you the tweet. Here it is. So this is the tweet. John Fetterman, I figure if I take up vaping and grabbing the hog during a live musical, they'll make me a folk hero. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. <laughs> oh, man. That was just wow. priceless. That's great. Grabbing the hog, she did. She got some hog. <laughs> Uh, she's gonna lose her seat. She's just, she is just out there. Oh, that's so funny to me. Yep, that's the family, the party of family values. Um, do you ever notice how it's? It just seems to me like Republicans are always the ones that are being indicted or in sex scandals or, you know, you see Democrats occasionally, but usually they're ousted pretty quick, and it's. And they're usually having boring things like affairs. Yeah. Not full on, like, you know, sex scandals or like crazy stuff in public. Like, yeah, well. They're having good old fashioned affairs. They're not good, but, you know. Yeah, well, like, even Bill Clinton, it was fairly discreet. I mean, he's having sex with his 22 year old intern. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, do we really give a shit? Is he. <laughs> I mean, that's more like a him and Hillary issue, but if you ask me, uh, you know, as a, yeah. you know, it's like if I have an employee and he's cheating on his wife or she's cheating on their, her husband or, you know, spouse or whatever, right? Do I really give a shit if they're showing up to work and doing the job? <laughs> Does it concern me as their employee? No, I don't want to know about it. I don't want to know anything. <laughs> Don't tell me that way. I won't have to be awkward around your spouse at the Christmas party. <laughs> right, right. Please just allow me to basically know anything. Yeah, just leave me out of it. <laughs> well, anyway, kind of a long news segment, but that was there was just so much to cover. We had to cover the. They were seeing Beetlejuice the musical too, so. I don't know. I guess if she if she says his penis's name three times, it'll appear. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Trying to think of so many, there's so many jokes we could do with that. <laughs> okay, well, let's do, a, let's do a clip. So I got, you want to do this Dave Ramsey one? Heck yeah, let's do it. All right, so this one's titled, I'm 59 years old with nothing saved for retirement. And yeah, we'll do, we'll, 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 we'll compare notes and see what he says. I haven't seen this, Lacey hasn't seen this, so we're going to. We're coming in cold. Listen, I haven't even heard the call yet, and I'm feeling like maybe 
he's going to tell someone to sell their car. Well, I don't know. Let's find out. He's going to tell let's them. Let's hear the call. Yeah, let's, let's sell your car. He likes to tell people to sell their cars. So I, as a complete blank thing, not even hearing this scenario, sell your car, it does, does feel like it's... <laughs> it might possible. be in there. Yeah. Cut up it your, might be in there. Cut up your credit cards and sell your car. That's it. <laughs> All right, let's see what he says. Hi, Dave. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. What's up? Well, um, I just recently sold my home and uh, paid off almost all of my debt. And um, But I'm 59, and I do not have any money in retirement. So um, I was wondering what your advice would be. Um, instead of taking all of the money that I have and putting it into a home, I was thinking that maybe I should beef up um, an investment account. Uh, but I know that your steps say that's like borrowing money to invest. But so how much debt do you have? How much debt do you currently have that you have not paid off? Well, I have a lease that has 30 months remaining, and um, it's 400 a month. So, okay. but it, uh, I just didn't think it would be wise to turn that over yet. Okay. And do you have anything else? Debt? No, okay. I am cash flowing my daughter's college right now, um, and no other debt. Okay. And um, how much money do you have that is in your account today with the sale of your house after you paid off some of the debts? Well, I have um, a total of two hundred and ninety. I put uh, ten thousand in my emergency fund, mm -hmm. and I have uh, about five thousand in an account because I haven't done my eighteen taxes yet. I'm just getting ready to do them. Gotcha. But um, if I was going to do a SEP, I'm self-employed, and if I was going to do a SEP, I wanted to. I've been waiting to figure out what to do before I. And what do you earn? What's your household income? Introducing uh, stocks by the slice from Fidelity. Now you can trade stocks and ETFs for any. All right. Pause. Three, two, one. Thirty thousand dollars a year. What kind of a business have you got? I do um, small business bookkeeping. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Okay. So it's fairly low impact, so you can do more of it and do it longer. That's that's a good news. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, um, what price range was the home you sold? It was it sold for five hundred eighteen thousand. Got it. Okay. And what city do you live in in Florida? I am just north of Palm Beach, Florida. Okay. All right. Oh, as in the Jupiter market, like that? Just just about Jupiter. Okay. All right. Where we are. Um, well, uh, I, uh, I would like to stay in the $300,000 range for home, and uh, so I was thinking maybe invest 200 into the house and take a small mortgage for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Hey, here's where, here's where we've got to get, here, here's our ratios. Here's the three right. or four numbers. Mm -hmm. that are the Before he gets into his ratios. So did I understand that correctly? She has about 290 k off the house. Part of it, five she needs for tax, 10 was in something else. Is that right? Well, I thought I, I thought I was hearing that differently. I thought, we have maybe have to listen to that again. I thought she had more from the house. I thought she said 290 was the equity. Let's go back a little bit. Um, Let's see. Yeah, let's do this. So she has the car lease, which you know, who cares? Um, Remaining, and um, it's four hundred a month. Okay, that's the so, car lease. But it, uh, I just didn't think it would be wise to turn that over yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you have anything else? In debt? No. Okay. I am cash flowing my daughter's college right now, um, and no other debt. Okay. And um, how much money do you have that is in your account today with the sale of your house after you paid off some of the debts? Well, I have um, a total of two hundred and ninety. Yeah, two ninety. Okay. Okay. So two ninety. Let's get ahead there. Go wherever. All right. So. <clears throat> 290 she could she's talking about so here's the deal boys and girls um 
for the federal government, not states necessarily, but for the federal government, typically when you, okay, so if I buy a house, right, let's say I buy a $250,000 house, and then in five years it goes up to, it's now worth 300000 350000 so I made 100000 in equity, okay? Now, when I sell the house, I can either take all the equity, the 100000 right? in cash, in which case I have to pay tax on it. Or I can take that money and put it into another house as a down payment, but it has to be a house of equal or greater value. So it has to be a bigger house kind of thing or a more expensive house. I can do that as long as it's like property, right? In the sense of, you know, this is my primary living place. I'm moving it to a primary living place, right? So I'm moving to a bigger house. I can do that. Now, if I try to do that where I go from a bigger house to a smaller house or a, a, a lower priced house, the IRS will not, well, I still have to pay tax on that money. The IRS will not let me do that, except for they will let you do it once in your life, the first time you do it. So if I want to go, in her case, she's going from a $518,000 home to she wants to do like a $300,000 home. She can do it one time and the IRS will waive the taxes on some of that money. I don't know if the whole amount, but it, at least a large chunk of that amount. Um, so she can do that. Um, now she said, okay, well, what if I put $200,000, 200,000 on the house, et cetera, right? There are a couple scenarios here where we could say, okay, well, the IRS says, let's say the total is 250 is what they'll, they'll waive for taxes. So 40,000, she can't waive. Okay. Well, what she can do is that she's going to have to pay tax on that 40,000, no matter what we do of the 290. Um, she can invest some of it now, um, or she can put it all down on the house. Now, what do you think Dave's going to do? I think he's going to say, put it all in the house. Right. Yep. And get rid of the car. Yeah. Just stupid. But anyway, so let's say, let's say she takes 190 and saves it. Um, she's 59. So let's say, and she has a job where she could work for a while, but let's say she invests it for till what full retirement. So she'll be almost 67. So 190, she puts a hundred in the house. Right. Um, so 190 for eight years, let's say, let's just conservatively say 8% just to be fair. And then we haven't gotten to whether or not she's got extra money to, to save, but. And of course, he's going to tell her she can get 12. Yeah. Well, whatever. We'll figure it out later. I don't know what else she can add to that account, uh, but she's talking about putting in a set. So she might have extra money out of the 70 grand, but if she's paying the $400 lease in the car, her rent and everything else, and she's helping her daughter with college, I don't know that she's got a ton of discretionary income that she can throw at investing. So we'll just assume she's not adding to that, but that 190 would be worth probably about 350 at 8% over eight years. That's assuming she gets eight, but you know, I think that's a conservative number. Um, but yeah, I mean, she could have over 300,000 in a retirement sort of scenario, retirement account, um, with a SEP, you can put up to what, 20% of your income, something like that. So she could do 10 probably in the SEP, no problem. And the rest in like a brokerage, um, and then just keep adding to the SEP and then just rolling money in there and taking the tax deduction. Um, but that would be that scenario. The negative to that would be if she had a $300,000 house, um, and let's go with right now, interest rates are seven, right? And this was recent. So let's say she gets an interest rate at, let's say six, just to be fair, um, for a $300,000 house and she gets a 30 year mortgage, let's say. Her payment would be um, 
1800 a month for a $300,000 house. But remember, in my, in my scenario, she put down 100000 So she's only borrowing two. So she would have $1,200 a month for the payment of the house. Now, in her scenario where she's putting 200000 into the house, um, she would only have it would be about $600 a month, about half what, what I'm guessing, but she'd only have 90 grand to save. We were doing 8% for eight years. She, that'd be 166,000 in retirement savings. And so, uh, with a SEP, it's actually 25% for employees, um, for, for employees, for the employer. No, no, for employee because when it is twenty five for the employer, but when you factor in the um, how you do the taxes, it ends up being twenty. Trust me, I've done a ton of them. It's, it ends up being twenty for the employer, and since she's self employed, she'd only get to put in twenty. If she was paying for her employee, she could put in twenty five percent. So, but yeah, good call on that one. Um, but yeah, I mean, so she'd have roughly two hundred thousand dollars less in savings, right? But she'd only have a $600 a month payment on the house. As opposed to, we could even take, you know, her house in eight years, and if she has enough in retirement savings, she could put the $50,000 $50, payment down and get, get rid of, to lower her payment, right? Refinance, which you probably right. do anyway at a lower interest rate. So, yeah, I mean... There's a couple different things she could do. I think a probably smarter move would be to have the cash saved because if she's in a position where she needs money in retirement or more money in retirement, if she gets sick and she can't work or something happens, she has it liquid or at least fairly liquid as where a home is illiquid, which is the one thing he always misses. Right. And you know, if she's getting a, a home loan, and she's struggling or whatnot, she can always refinance or, or do other things. There are other options there. So there's not like an immediate, like she's going to be evicted if she doesn't pay one month, right? Or she's behind or something, as opposed to if she has a medical problem and she needs the cash right away, or if she has, you know, a financial emergency or whatever it is, right? All kinds of things can happen. She at least has the cash available because if she's in a situation where she needs money and she doesn't have it, then the only asset she has is the house and she's got to sell the house to get cash to raise money, which is the big risk of putting all your money directly into the illiquid asset. Right. And he's going to uh, get her to give up this lease vehicle she's got and um, he'll have her more into the house. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see what he does. Yeah. Let's see if there's more information that comes out here. Oh. oh, I'm not getting any sound. Hello. What do we do? Where were we? More of it and do it longer. That's, that's a good news. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, what price range was the home you sold? It was, it sold for oh, 118000 Got it. What? We got to go further than that. We were further along than that. Yeah, no, we were right about, we, were, we weren't that much further. I also want to remind everybody, this is one and a quarter speed. This is how slow he is. Okay. And what city do you live in in Florida? I am just north of Palm Beach, Florida. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. oh, as in the Jupiter market like that? Just, just about Jupiter. Okay. All right. I know where you are. Um, well, uh, I, would, I would like to stay in the $300,000 range for home. And uh, so I was thinking maybe invest 200 into the house and take a small mortgage for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And here's where, here's where we got to get, here, here's our ratios. Here's the three or four numbers mm -hmm. that are the big numbers in your equation. Okay. The, the, by age 70 something. Okay. 15 years, 75. Okay. 15 years from now, we have to have a nest egg and a paid for house. Mm -hmm. We currently have 290,000 to do that with, and we have $70,000 a year to do that with. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And so that's you working to 75. Okay. Mm -hmm. If we, you know, or to 72 or whatever, if you say 12 years, I don't care. Oh, wait, I don't know where he's getting this. Does he have some chart somewhere that I'm not aware of? I don't know. I'm not sure. Why don't you ask her um, what she's trying to do? Well, be, but, he doesn't care what she's trying to do. He's got a formula. Let's look at the rest of his formula. Oh, my God. Him. Oh, okay, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt the, the, the guru here. My bad. Formula. Let's hear the rest of the formula. Okay, right. she's gonna work until she kills over her five. desk. Yeah, she's gonna work until she's seventy-five, and she's gonna somehow pay off the house and somehow have enough in uh, retirement saving. Two hundred ninety thousand retirement right. savings. Because if you do not have a paid-for house when you're through working, um, you're going to have a major problem because it destabilizes your whole situation. Have a mortgage when you are retired. We do not want to go into retirement, retirement with no with a mortgage. So we've got to clear the house. Why not? The second thing, then, every dollar we pay into this house, obviously. That doesn't make any sense. Should I keep playing this? Do you want to hear the whole thing before we Absolutely. go before we go at it? Because that the yeah, no, I want to hear the rest of it. Oh it God! Day. And borrowing it doesn't fix that because we got to, if you borrowed on your house and say, okay, I want to put two hundred down and uh, and I have a hundred thousand dollar mortgage. Uh, well, then, you know, I still got to pay the 100000 off. And that's still 100000 that's not going into my retirement this day. So what would I do if I woke up in your shoes? Now, here's what I would do if I woke up in your shoes. I don't know what you'll do, but this is what I would do. I would buy a $200,000 house for cash, which in your area ain't much of a house. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's an okay house. It's certainly not a shack, but it's a pretty far step down from where you were living. I understand that when I'm saying this. I'm going somewhere with this. Don't quit on me until we finish talking, okay? So I would start there, and um, I'd pay off my car today. Find out what the early buyout on it is. It's probably around 12 grand, probably 11, 10, 11 grand, something like that, and find out what the buyout is and just pay the stupid thing off and own the car, okay? Uh, or sell it and get one that you pay cash for. I don't care. Spend ten or $12,000 doing that, 20000 bucks, whatever it takes. Let's get out of this car lease. No more payments. Now, we got zero payments now in my little scenario, the world I just invented, okay? And we've got $50,000 or so to start investing, start our investing process into good mutual funds. Then you load up a SEP, you load up a Roth IRA, and you do everything you can to increase the number of accounts you keep books for, and let's increase your income. And let's bust it for a few years. Now, if we can get you up to a half million dollars in savings for your retirement in a few years, and you want to move up in-house and pay cash for the move up, that'll be okay. That means we've gotten past the danger zone. But you retiring with zero money or close to zero money and a nice paid for house isn't. Okay, so uh, so in this scenario, what's crazy is he just left her with only fifty thousand to invest, and he somehow thinks in a few years he's getting her up to having half a million invested in her retirement accounts when her income has been seventy thousand. I'm sorry, I understand how the path or of compounding is a beautiful thing, but I don't know what the hell you're compounding to get to a half a million. And I know he's telling her to get more accounts, but I don't think she's going from 70,000 to 300,000 in the course of the next year or anything. Like that's a jump most people aren't making. Well, let's say 15 years, she has half a million. That's what they, he's saying by the time she's 75. So she'll have half a million, she'll be too old to spend it, but That's uh, this is the whole thing here, kids, is trade your youth, trade the good years of your life so you could have a lot of money when you're old and can't do anything with it. <laughs> That's the whole fucking scenario. But let's say 15 years, and I'm giving him 12% interest, 50000 to start. How much would she have to contribute each year to get to $500,000? Okay? Let's see. 12%. Maybe if I did that right. That can't be right. Hang on. Oh, Jesus. Just that. So let's say, because that seems like ridiculous to me. So let's say that. I'm not even doing like, 
you know, hardcore math, but just like napkin math is making me feel like he's saying she needs to be saving like 30 grand a year, roughly. Oh, no, she needs to be saving. Maybe not quite, but. She needs to be saving. I'm doing on 10%. Uh, I'm 12. She needs to be saving 20,000 a year. Uh, so 1700 a month. Thousand times. We'll do eight. So she's making roughly around $4,600 a month. He wants her to, uh, so 4,600, remember that number real quick. He wants her to save 1,700 a month. So she needs to save 37% of her income. To get to, and 15, you to be 75 with half a million by his scenario. How is she paying for her daughter's college? No, she's not. She has, granted, she doesn't have a mortgage payment, but she's going to probably have an HOA payment. She's going to have to pay for, you know, taxes and maintenance and all that shit on the house. Um, you know, as well with my scenario, it's like, okay, yeah, you still have a mortgage on the house, right? Um, but you got a $300,000 home that has a much better chance of growing in equity than a $200,000 piece of shit, like he's suggesting. So at least you have the home gaining in some value. On top of that fact, in my scenario, by the time she's 67, if she invests 100 and, or what was 190,000 I put in, if she invests 190,000, she could have over $300,000 sitting in a bank account, sitting in a brokerage account or in a retirement account. So she'd have three hundred thousand to three hundred fifty thousand dollars cash, and I'm using eight percent. I'm giving him twelve. So I've handicapped myself, and I've still put her in a better position at sixty-seven than he's put her in at fifty or at seventy-five. The, the one thing I agree with is if she wants to pay off the car, I'm like that's not a bad idea. <laughs> Well, yeah. If you, I mean, if you want to get rid of the fucking car payment, I don't, I mean, you can, you don't have to. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I freaking called it even blindly that he'd tell them to get rid of the car. That being said, car leases are a really expensive deal. I think really are a really, really expensive way to have a car. And so. Yeah. At 400 I, bucks, at 400 I, bucks a month. Well, she, she said she, she, she money for well. She said she has sure. thirty payments. That's twelve thousand dollars. So just right. If you just want to pay twelve thousand and get rid of the fucking payment, especially since you have the money because of the sale of the house, like right. just make that go away. Yeah, you know? it's one of those where it's like I would tell the client it's kind of up to you what you want to do. If it were me, the only the only reason I would mainly do it is just so I don't have to worry about that fucking payment. I never have to think about it. It's gone. Right, and turn your focus on to something else. Yeah, I'm just lazy that way. I would rather just get rid of it because of that, because I don't want to. I don't want to have to pay that every month. But um, you know, and then it'd be like, okay, and then if you did that, you could save for maybe we could save four hundred dollars a month, which would add to your nest egg. Yeah, but I, this whole yeah, throw it all at the the house and just buy a house cash it's like okay potentially what we could do those she'd be saving let's say 1200 a month so let me let me do this real quick let's see so let's say she could save 1200 a month so she'd have to add another 500 on on his plan to make it to to that. So if she got rid of the car and the house, so 400, let's say 1200 for the house so 16. So she could actually be at half a million dollars by 75 roughly. 
by his, his method, or if she did my method and she invested the 190, um, and I'm going to give myself 10% now because fuck him. That's why. Um, and she's, and she was making a payment on the house and the payment on the car. So let's say she didn't invest anything else, hypothetically, just to make it fair. I would have her at $790,000. That's why I still kick his ass by almost 300 grand. And he's getting 12% and I'm only getting 10 by his calculations. I mean, that's just ridiculous. The thing that, that, that they miss, I mean, they, you know, compound interest is great and everything, but you have to have money first. And if you have $200,000 to throw in there right now, it's going to grow quick. You know, I mean, it's just a matter of time, especially if you've got 10 or 15 years. Well, with that would be too, if, if you are, you know, using your 10% that we gave you, it doubles in seven years. So she puts 200,000 in, if she really works till his 75, she could double it twice. Yeah. Well, then she's, but under know. mine, well, we, but you're using the, the old cal the 10% calculation because mine, it does double twice. It goes to four right. and then it goes to almost eight. Right. By his method, she's got to save money every month because she doesn't start with the big amount to double. Uh -huh. So Correct. it's a monthly, installments that are getting put in there. So as the monthly installments trickle in, she's got to pay out all that money every month. On top of that fact, by the end of it, I mean, the upside to his is at mine, it's, she said 790,000, but she still has a mortgage payment. The car's paid off by now, but she still has a mortgage payment, right? And so even hypothetically on that, what is she going to owe on the house? left on the mortgage payment, she if she really, really wanted to, we could take money out of that $790,000 and pay off the house. And she'd still have at least 600,000 left. At the very least. And she wouldn't have had to kill herself because she would also had the option at 67 to retire. Mm hmm. And if she only wanted to work part time and enjoy her time more. Yeah, the difference is, is he's assuming that this is all about acquisition of as much shit as you can get acquisition of wealth, right? As opposed to, do you want to enjoy the good years you have left? You know, you got to tell me your priority is the client because this just seems, I mean, basically he's got her work until 75. So she can have all this shit that, okay, but now you're 75, you're too old to use it. Right. I mean, he assumes that his priorities are the ones that everybody is inclined to have. Right. He doesn't assume there's a diverse sort of group of people with diverse needs and hopes, yeah. you know? Uh, I guess that makes sense if you're a multimillionaire. Grew up with a lot of money. Uh, let's see what else. But yeah. Not a plan. Right. And so I'm going to scale your house back to get the other stuff started. And then, you know, in five years, when you see that this is working and you want to move up in house again, move up to about a 400 and pay cash for it. And, you know, I think you'll be able to do that later in this plan. Whoa, 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 whoa. Make... Where's she going to get the, the 400,000? I told you that earlier. I told you that he's he's got her you you totally missed that part he somehow thinks that she's gonna make it to half a million in the next few years those are his words you took this as by the time she's 75 no he said in the next few years when you get this to a half a million dollars well even then the two hundred thousand. even okay so let's start with the fifty thousand. She's going to get to 200,000. I'll give him 12% again. And she's going to get there. It's going to happen in the next few years. Well, let's say eight years, just to be simple. 
what would she have to Jesus Christ. She has to save 26,000 a year. She has to save $2,200 a month. It's half her income. Well, not under his plan. Under his plan, she's like taking on freaking double the clients or something. Yeah, she's working 90 hour weeks. Jesus Christ. So you have no life and you don't get to enjoy any of your retirement. But when you die, you'll have some money. <laughs> and you can get a bigger house again. Yeah. That way when they, uh, when you go to Valhalla, you can take it all with you. <laughs> the Vikings believe that you could take all, yeah. There it was. I'm a Viking, I'm aware. There you go. Sure, we first have got the wolf away from the door. Mm -hmm. So I would live in that $200,000 house for three to five years while I got my nest egg roaring. And when it's roaring, it's going Oh, big. shit. That's even better. Three to five years? God, I did eight, didn't he I? Said, you, you do not listen to me, I swear. I swear to God, you're right. Sorry, Lacey. Uh, you... He did not mean eight years. You were like, well, maybe in almost a decade she'll have that much and she could... No. He saw how things magically in under five years this woman's going to be up to half a million on his plan and she's going to be able to get double the house that she gets under his original plan. It literally doesn't make any sense. Like He literally is broken and can't do math. Yeah, she'd have to save $45,000 a year. Which is more than half of her income. Yeah. Even, okay, I would, here's what I would give. Even I if we gave her 100000 100, equity in that. From $70,000 a year to ninety. like if she took on more clients, she could go from like seventy right. to ninety. but like that's still freaking half her income. Yeah, what the, what was the, what did I do? Oh, this guy got screwed up. Do, do, do. Oops. Yeah, I, this is just ridiculous. I might have done that wrong. Hang on, let me double check. To 12, 5 years. 500,000. Let's say 400,000. Let's say she gets $100,000 equity for the house. She'd have to pay, yeah, she'd have to save 4000 a month, almost 50000 a year. And she only makes 4600 So she's going to have to live off $600 a month. Somehow. I, I don't, yeah. I don't know where they're getting these numbers from. And he promised us a couple ratios, and he never gave us any ratios. Do you ever notice that? Does he know what a ratio is? <laughs> So. Yeah. Usually you have to divide something by something to get a ratio, Dave. One number over another number looks a little like a fraction. Yeah. Oh man. Well that was that was Dave. I don't know that I want to do you want to see any more of this or No, no, I, I Yeah, it was that much. We're good. We're good. Well, uh did you want to do one more or are we you good for today? I, I feel like I'm good for today. I'm tired. Honestly. All right, cool. Well, then let's uh, let's wrap up, and we'll catch everybody next if time. Good, we can uh, we can hold it over if it's oh, if it's interesting. I haven't really watched it, so I don't know. Anyway, um, yeah. So that's it. We're gonna bail. Thanks everybody for watching. Uh, Lacey, where can everybody catch you at? As always, you can catch me in my material at mysensewithsense.com. You can find articles workshops I do, information about my course. If you want further information about any of those things, email us or mm -hmm. send us clips. We've gotten some good ones from viewers. We've really appreciated mm -hmm. and enjoyed. Yep. Topic requests, um, if you uh, maybe disagree with something we have to say, you could invite yourself on. We'd love to talk to you. Absolutely. And if they want to do that, how should they contact us? And you can contact us via email at gossipfinancead at outlook.com. It's down below. Thanks, everybody, for watching, and we'll catch you next time. And I'll cut it there.